much for recording. So hi everyone, so I'm Penny, Penny Lewis. I'm a senior clinical lecturer in pharmacy practice and I am the academic career development lead for the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration. So we've got a few slides for you um, this afternoon. Um, do you want to share your screen or shall I share mine, Ross? Uh, are you happy to share, Penny? Yeah, so okay. yeah, of course, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, just for the benefit of everybody that's just joining as well, my name is Ross Atkinson. I'm a programme manager working for the ARC GM. So I work with several of the research themes. So I work with digital health, organising care, and also support Penny with capacity building. Okay. So hopefully you can see that. Is that the full slide, Ross, or is it just part? Um, it's just part, so I think we just need to go into slide, uh, presentation mode. Okay. That's perfect. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about the two opportunities that we have advertised recently, um, the internship programme and the P-Doctoral Fellowship programme. Um, at various points there are um, times where you can ask questions or you can wait till the, the end um, it's very feel free to put um, questions in the chat as well um, as, as we go along so I thought it'd be good just to explain what the ARC is um, because there are many acronyms flying around especially in relation to research and the NIHR so the ARC um, is a infrastructure funding. So basically the ARC funds staff who work with them on a contractual basis for a period of time. And this current ARC um, runs until the March 26. And the ARC is really about supporting applied health and care research that responds to the needs of the local um, population and the local health and care system. So we're really there to look at applied research that has benefit to the people of Greater Manchester. There are 15 ARCs across the UK, um, across England, sorry, um, all meeting the needs of their local population. And within our arc, there are seven research themes. Different arcs have different themes uh, and different numbers of themes, but we have seven. Um, they include um, economic sustainability, mental health, um, um, healthy ageing. This is always a test for me. Um, implementation science, evaluation. Um, and we also have capacity building, which I am the lead of, and public and community involvement and engagement. And I may have missed out a couple there, but you can find all of our ARC themes on our website. So the team relation to capacity building, obviously myself, we also have Beck Elvey, who's not here today. Um, she supports us with our delivery of our programmes as well. And then Ross here is on the call. So in terms of the opportunities that we are providing, um, the deadline for the internship and the pre-doctoral fellowships um, are the 24th of May. So it's not too far in the future at five o'clock. Um, we do a shortlisting uh, process beginning the week of the 17th of June and the interviews have already been set for the 11th of July. So if you have or, or are going to apply, please do um, put that date in your diary um, just to make sure that you're able to attend. All the information that you need in terms of applying and the actual online application form are found on the website, which is on this link here. In terms of the information, uh, in terms of guidance, the guidance document covers both the internships and the pre-doctoral fellowships. We try to make that as clear as possible, but do make sure that you're reading the information that's relevant for the programme that you want to apply for. There is only one online application for both those opportunities, but you get the opportunity to, to select which of those that you want to apply for. Those that apply for the pre-doctoral fellowships can select to be considered for an internship if they were not successful for the pre-doctoral fellowship programme. So it's something you could tick to say that you'd be happy to be considered for that programme. Um, and that has happened in the past and, and been quite successful where people have taken up the internship um, if, if they weren't successful at the pre-doc. If you've got any questions, feel free after this event and um, things that come to you after this, then please email the ArcGM email address or Ross directly. 
So fundamentally, you have to be a graduate um, of a, a particular health and care profession, um, nursing, midwifery, social work, social care, all the allied health professions, pharmacy. Um, you could be from a commissioning background or a policymaker within health and care. However, you cannot be a, a, a medicine or dentistry uh, professional. You must be employed by a health care organisation in Greater Manchester. So um, typically that will be clear from your organisation. However, if you work in a service that perhaps is physically situated outside Greater Manchester, but they provide services to Greater Manchester, I think the ambulance service was one of those, then do get in touch and we can confirm whether or not you're eligible. But you would be if services are delivered across Greater Manchester typically. Um, so that could be um, your employer could be an NHS trust, it could be a local authority or it could be a voluntary sector organisation and that's fine as well. However, we don't accept applications from those that work in the private health sector. So we're going to talk about the internships. These internships are, provide um, up to 30 days experience working within a research setting. However, there is no backfill funding for, um, for that program. It's really there for those that really want to dip into what research is about. Something perhaps might have sparked your interest in research, but you're not really sure what that would look like on a day to day level and you want that exposure. It gives you the opportunity to work up your own ideas a little bit, think about a suitable kind of approaches, gives you an opportunity to network with others, have conversations about um, your interests in research and undertake some training, some kind of basic level kind of training. So there is a programme of training that you will go through that covers things like um, patient and public involvement, um, reading the literature, searching the literature, developing a research question um, amongst others. You do need to be supported by a supervisor from ArcGM and those supervisors are allocated you, to you through a matching process. There's no need for you to find your own supervisor for the internship. We will find them for you, depending on what your needs are. The projects, um, the internships, sorry, are not intended for you to undertake your own project in its entirety unless they are you know, well developed feasible and your supervisor will support you with that. So you can have conversations about your own ideas, but don't come on to the internship with the expectation that you will completely fully undertake, I don't know, a full evaluation of a, a new service that you have um, implemented. You might gain the tools that you would need to be able to do that evaluation, but it may not be possible to actually do it as part of the internship. So the internship is flexible because everybody's different in terms of their expectations, what they want to learn, what they know already. But there are four core components. The first is that you get support from the capacity building team. So myself, Ross and Beck. The second is you'll get supervision and support from the theme that you are working within, as well as from other themes, depending on what your interests are. So it may be that you, for instance, um, are interested in mental health and that's where your internship uh, supervisor is situated but you're also interested in implementation science and, and how interventions are implemented in practice so you might get some support from them as well. You'll be supported to do some individualised kind of research activity in terms of um, perhaps working alongside your supervisor or other members of the theme perhaps conducting a systematic review or um, sitting on stakeholder engagement events, maybe helping with analysis. And your learning um, needs will be identified from the start through a process with your supervisor where you come up with some key priorities as to things that you want to come away with at the end. So those research activities actually map onto what you want to learn and also what opportunities there are going on at the time that you could perhaps link with um, to develop your own knowledge and skills. So interns have access to an individual training budget of up to £1,000. That could be used for you to undertake some training. The training doesn't have to be within the University of Manchester, although it may be. 
and that money could be used for you to attend a UK conference. So it would pay for your conference attendance in terms of the, the fees, but also the travel and um, accommodation. But it does have to be a UK conference. You will have access to all the training development resources that we have at the University of Manchester. So there's a huge range of resources, things like learning essentials, research essentials, covering all sorts of skills in terms of literature searching, um, analysis, basic things like referencing. And you have access to all of that, info, all of that resources through um, through your kind of log on details that you'll get through IT. You could take a master's level research module. So uh, many of our students might um, have a look at what's available and perhaps formally undertake them. That has to be discussed with your supervisor as to whether you formally undertake the assessment. So that requires quite a lot of work and would usually fill up quite a, a huge proportion of your of your time on the internship. So you could have a discussion about the relative merits of doing that versus the drawbacks in terms of it um, not not necessarily being able to undertake much else other than that unit or what a lot of students um, interns do is actually they have audit only access which basically means you get to see all the materials work through all the materials but you don't set this sit the assessment for that research module so you still get the learning but without the, the time that's required to undertake the assessment we have put together a lifelong learning portal, which is accessible through your own sort of work email address, where all of the training resources are kind of pooled so that you can dip into those um, as and when you need to. Um, we are aware that some of the core training sessions that we set up, you may not be able to attend due to co other commitments. Um, so they're all recorded and placed in that lifelong learning portal. And as an intern, you are um, what is called an NIHR Academy member, which gives you access to um, the, uh, an online system called NIHR Learn, where again, there's a, a whole kind of suite of training resources um, that would um, be relevant to, to research. So in terms of applying for the internship, you really need to explain why you want to do the internship, what what benefits it would bring to you, what sparked your interest, how might this be of use to your kind of practice. What we're really looking for as well, because you know 30 days isn't a particularly long time, what is it that you want to be able to do by the internship that you can't do now? So what do you want to learn? And that will really help us kind of match you with the most appropriate supervisor for them to kind of support you in meeting that learning need. And then as I've kind of touched upon, how will doing the internship fit with your career um, as a practitioner? So that's the internship programme. If anyone's got any questions about this now, I'll happily take them. I can't see the chat, Ross, so I don't know if there's anything in there. Uh, there's nothing in the chat at the moment, but I know that a couple of people might be typing, so we'll just give it a, a few seconds. But yeah, um, the internships are really good opportunities, as Penny mentioned, just to sort of break into to applied to health research and just to flag at this point that um, the ARC is about applied research. It's about research um, for the for the benefit of, of um, people using the services. So we don't do research that's at the far end of the sort of what we call the translational pathway. So we don't do any lab based or, or basic science research. So it's all applied um, health research. And that's just something to bear in mind when people people uh, are applying and, and drafting their the answers to the questions about their research ideas. So mm -hmm. we've got a couple of questions in, in the chat, Penny. Um, so uh, somebody was just wondering about what the examples of the master's level research modules that can be undertaken. Um, so there are several modules that are part of the um, Masters of Clinical Research, and we know that not everybody is, uh, um, wants to do um, it, as a um, sort of mentioned before we, we do applied health research but the, the masters that we closely most closely align to at the university of manchester is the the masters of clinical research 
but that encompasses um, research modules that are applicable to people in different care, health and care settings. So if you are from a social care background, there will be modules in there that are still relevant. Um, some of the language we, we understand is, is less relevant to people in social care, so there might be more of an emphasis on, on clinical um, uh, um, terminology, but the, the modules include things like research design, uh, critical appraisal and evidence synthesis or so systematic reviewing, which is a type of secondary research, um, statistics, uh, quantitative research, qualitative research. So there's a if you, if you have a look at the University of Manchester Ma Masters of Clinical Research, um, you should be able to see the, the modules that are there. But also just to mention that you can access modules from other universities in Greater Manchester, so Manchester Metropolitan, Salford and, and Bolton. So if there are modules elsewhere that you think uh, are more suited to your area of practice, then that's absolutely fine. And if people want to apply to to access funding for those, we can support that. I think that I will just say about access to modules through the paid route if you if you would like to access funding is just to get the, the agreement of your supervisor at that point. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a time commitment. Um, so it, you need to have that discussion about whether that's how you want to spend that that 30 hours um, of your internship or whether that's something you could actually put into a pre-doc application if that's the route you wanted to go down in the future. Um, where you have a more more time really to dedicate to that. Okay. It's funny. We just got a couple of other questions. So, um, with regards to the research theme, do you only choose one? So, for the internships, um, you can identify a research theme that you think your work fits most closely with, and you can and you can include that in your application. I think it's more relevant for the pre-doctoral fellowships. Um, but if you look at the um, research themes on the ArcGM page, you'll see the strategic objectives and, and the type of projects that are undertaken within that theme. Um, so it might be that your work aligns with a couple of different themes, but really, if you're applying to the, the internships, we wouldn't expect that you that you would need to identify a research theme that that's the one that you want to work in. It's, it, the, the research themes are quite fluid as well, so a lot of the teams will work across different um, different themes themes of, of research. Um, again, we'll come on to, to the research themes in a bit more detail when we speak about um, pre-doctoral fellowships, but for the internships, you can highlight where you, there's alignment with the, the research themes, but we don't necessarily um, ask you to say that you want to work within one specific theme. No. So another question, Penny, we've got uh, somebody said they're a humanities graduate. I'm not sure if I'll be eligible, but uh, they meet the other criteria. OK, um, but working in a health and care organisation. Um, so I, I think perhaps if you wanted to send us an email after this, we can we can have a discussion about that. I mean, I think if you're working in health and care, then typically, yes, but I wouldn't like to say absolutely without perhaps having a conversation. Um, first. We, we understand that, that sort of people come from different educational yeah. backgrounds. As well. I think the key thing is, like Penny said, is that you're working in an organisation in Greater Manchester that delivers health and care. So yeah. examples um, of people who are maybe uh, less well sort of represented in research. We have people from health commissioning backgrounds, um, people from, from social care, um, people from health improvement, also people that have come from um, sort of charitable organisations. So I think yeah. it's more dependent like, on the yeah. role that you take yeah, in, in your yeah. organisation. But yeah, that's a good point. If you want to drop us a, an email, we can we can discuss that. Yeah. And then one last question, could uh, could I ask about the interview process? Is there a presentation? Is it in person or online? So, so there is no presentation. Not for the internships. There's no the no presentation for the for the interview. Um, they're fairly short um, interviews, and really that's to give us a, a good understanding of of um, you as a person, why you want to do the internship, and and really helps us try and match you up with a supervisor. And they are online. And yes, they are online. Couple more questions, actually, just one. Um, how many internships are available? Um, and that is quite flexible, to be honest. So we, you know, we, we do have a limit in terms of 
our capacity to supervise internships, um, but we support as many people as we can. Uh, so the internships are not backfill funded. Um, so we don't have a cap in terms of funding to fund the internships. Um, it, it's about the ability for us to uh, take on the number of people that it, the themes have capacity to support. So um, I think the most we took on one year was was eight internships. Um, yeah. So we have we support quite a number of people, um, and as Penny mentioned, um, people who uh, apply for the pre-doctoral fellowships may also um, tick the box on the application form saying that they want to be considered for the research internship, and that will be purely based on on the quality of applications that we receive for both of those schemes. Um, so in 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 essence, uh, we support as many people as we can for for the with the internships. OK, shall I move on? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Penny. OK, so we're going to talk about the pre-doctoral fellowships now. So these are really fundamentally for those who have some experience of research. So you can't be completely naive to research. You have some exposure already enough to know that you would like to undertake a PhD, basically. So undertaking and and and. Uh, Gaining funding to do a PhD is uh, particularly onerous. It's um, it's a very competitive process. So we're aware of that. So this pre-doctoral fellowship gives you the time and space and access to the expertise and training for you to put in a competitive PhD application. Um, because of the time that this takes, you are provided with backfill funding. Um, it's a maximum of £20,000. We realise that might not cover everybody's salary. At, um, so um of half their time so we are flexible with that um if we think what you want to achieve is doable in less time then please do have a conversation with your potential supervisor to to discuss that so that but that bill funding goes direct to your employer to release you for up to half um your time over 12 months because the um arc is going on until march 26 there is a possibility to extend up to 18 months if you want to spread that time out even further. In the past, we've been able to sort of um, have it at like 0.25 full time equivalent up to two years. But because our arc is um, sort of that current arc is kind of ending in 18 months, that's as far as we can go. So we are really flexible with the, the time commitment and how you take that time. It might be that you have chunks of time because that works better, or it could be that it's regular time on each day, you know, on certain days of, of the week. It's all to be as flexible as we can around your kind of clinical or practitioner responsibilities that you that you have uh, and so that we can be inclusive. So the pre-doc fellowships come with a training budget of £2,000, so it's more than the internship, and that does enable you to undertake formal um, research unit kind of modules, as Ross mentioned, the MCLIN res modules, it may be that you want to undertake one of those, and it does pay for um, UK conference attendance. You get access again, as you do with the internship, to all the training development resources that could support you. And um, you can access other courses. So like we said, you don't have to just um, undertake training that is offered by the University of Manchester. It may be that you want to undertake training led by the Social Research Association in Oxford um, or a Salford course or a Man Met course. And again, as with the internships, you can dip into some of the um, master's level research training by just doing audit only access so you can see the materials and work through them without doing the assessment if that's something you want to do. Similarly to the internship, you have access to um, resources through the Lifelong Learning Portal and as an Academy member, access to NIHR Learn. In terms of the pre-docs, you need to have a, at least one supervisor in place to support you with your application, um, but you can have up to three overall. You need to be clear who your primary supervisor is. They don't have to be within the ARC, your primary supervisor. They, um, your ARC supervisor could be a second supervisor, but you do have to have one of one of your supervisors to be from within the ARC.
In terms of what makes a good primary academic supervisor, you would want them to have a previous experience of um, supervising PhD successfully. Um, they should have experience in your research area, so have an interest in your topic, or it could be that they are key in terms of your rev relevant methodology that you want to use. However, if it is about methodology, um, then you would need somebody else within your team, your secondary supervisor, to have that experience in your research topic. You should think about how easy it is for you to maintain contact with them. Obviously, with the advent of sort of online Teams meetings, then that has become easier over recent years. But think about their kind of um, time commitment and the time that they can dedicate to support you with your your pre doc fellowship and and uh, ultimately your pre uh, PhD application. You would want them really ideally to be a suitable supervisor for your follow on PhD, but for your primary academic supervisor for the uh, fellowship. However, the entire team that you choose that you have around you for your pre doc doesn't necessarily have to be that ultimate team for your PhD, because it may be that you work up your PhD during your pre doctoral fellowship and realise actually you could you know, a seek um, a supervisor has expertise in a particular methodology that you've decided that that would be the most appropriate approach for your research question, for instance. So there is scope for you to work over the pre-doctoral fellowship to pull in your ultimate kind of PhD team, um, but it would be good to have some of that team remaining for the for the PhD. In terms of finding supervisors, um, universities have postgraduate tutors who you can go to to um, kind of signpost you to appropriate um, supervisors or in terms of particularly in terms of the ARC um, supervisors please do put your email address in the chat and Ross can send out a list of potential supervisors from within the ARC and their expertise um, because I know it can be you know, there are, obviously you can go on through our website. There's lots of stuff that we have in, in the organisation. Um, so please do contact us if you want that list of people. It doesn't stop you from um, looking through the profiles on online through Pure or um, ResearchGate or whatever kind of programme that you use or system that you use to learn about people's research and contacting people directly. But do feel free to get in touch with us if you are struggling or you'd like that list of pre-doc supervisors that we have. This slide kind of um, demonstrates what we would look for in your application and certainly what is looked for in a PhD, a full PhD application. Um, we want to look at you as a person. So is this right for you? Is the uh, do you have some uh, experience and knowledge of research already so that we know that you, this is something that you're going to want to then carry on and do? Um, obviously, if you're completely naive to research, it may be that this isn't for you. Um, so we're looking for somebody that has had some exposure to research and knows how research would benefit them and their career and the service that they work in which links to place. So we're looking at the environment that you work in how would research being research active um, supplement what you do? How would it benefit what you do? Have you got the support within the team for you to be doing this? However, please don't let that put you off if you work in uh, an area which actually isn't research active, because we are very much looking to be inclusive and support capacity um, in terms of research in those areas where there's very little going on. So don't let that put you off. Um, just be sort of, you know, be open and transparent about that if research isn't something that is key in in the area of practice that you're in. Um, you could you can discuss that, but you do need support from your line manager to um to to be able to be kind of deemed eligible. We're also looking at the actual ideas that you've got. So the proposal itself, what area of interest do you have? What topic um, are you interested in researching? Why? What is the gap? How would that knowledge gap, if you were to fill it, benefit the users of your service, the patients, the public, um, and 
what do you need to know to be able to build that proposal? What do you need to do to build up a really strong proposal in that area? So the pre-doc gives you time to work on that idea. Um, but what we need is enough to be able to understand its importance um, for you to be able to articulate what the gaps are in terms of what you need to do. So it may be that you've got a broad research area and often is the case that actually there's so, so many uh, avenues you could go down with your proposal. There's multiple research questions or topics and what you want to do in the pre-doc is refine that and narrow that down into something that's doable in a PhD. It may be that to do that you need to organise stakeholder engagement, work with patients and the public. Um, what activities might you do to refine that idea? And it may be that you've got a re good research question, but your research knowledge in terms of methodology is limited and you need to expand that in order to design a robust research protocol. And then we want to look at your potential um, in terms of is this likely to go on then to be a successful application for a PhD in the future? And will that um, support you into in, in becoming a, a practitioner academic in the future. So I've touched on a little bit of this already, but what should you include in your pre-doctoral application? So we want to know a bit about your professional background and why you've got an interest in research. So what have you done already that can sort of demonstrate that um, exposure to research? We want details of your supervisory support, so we want that um, clear support in terms of the research topic or the research, cl the clinical or the practitioner area, but also what methodological support for that project. A timeline um, for when you are going to undertake particular activities in your pre-doc. You don't have to, but you could send us a Gantt separately by email if you want to. A Gantt chart is required for a PhD application, so sometimes it's good to kind of get into that habit of mapping things out using the Gantt chart. But what are the timelines for achieving the things that you want to achieve in the pre-doc? We want to know what training you'd like to do during the pre-doctoral uh, fellowship. Be specific, tell us what modules, what units you want to do and where and um, when these are ran and estimated costs. Um, often there isn't much detail provided on this and that will be marked down a little. Um, we want you to do that kind of upfront um, research into what's out there and what kind of course you'd like to do. Obviously, if you with your supervisors decide that um, perhaps some of that training needs to be adapted, um, then that's fine. But upfront, we want to know what kind of training courses you want to do and where they are. Think about what you're going to do in the fellowship. So it's clear, you need to try and make it clear what, um, what you need to do, what activities you want to do in the fellowship. Is it a literature review? Because you need to um, kind of unpick the issue a little bit more. Um, is it stakeholder engagement? Is it both of those things? And then work out, and then what your PhD might look like. So try and make that clear. What What is, what is it? The idea for the PhD versus what are you going to do in the pre-doctoral fellowship that makes it easier for us to to judge the kind of feasibility of what you're suggesting that you do because sometimes those lines are blurred um, and what you want to do in the PhD kind of morphs into the fellowship um, which could be impractical so we want it to be clear the, how the work that you're going to do in the fellowship will feed into the PhD proposal itself and get in touch with finance sooner rather than later so that we, you've got a clear um, handle on the on, on the time that and the costs associated with your time. So if you haven't done that already and you're going to apply, do get in touch with um, your local kind of finance um, administrator so you can find out um, that information. So I'm going to hand over to Ross now who's going to um, just describe the compare and contrast the internship and the pre-doctoral fellowship. Thanks very much, Penny. 
So as Penny said, the, the benefits um, to both of our schemes in terms of uh, the stage at which people are in their career and, and which um, opportunity um, might suit you best is something for you to, to decide. Um, so the application form for the pre-doctoral fellowship is longer and has a lot more sort of detail required uh, compared to the internship. And one of the queries that we do get is which, which of the schemes will probably suit me best. So this table we've just put together really to, to sort of compare and contrast uh, the two schemes. Um, so the eligibility criteria are the same with the exception of essentially the pre-doctoral fellowship. You will need more experience. You'll need some to start to build up a CV that is, is geared towards research in some way. We don't expect you to be um, an independent researcher. We don't expect you to have had um, grant funding or lots of publications, but there should be evidence in your CV that for a pre-doctoral fellowship that you are starting to work towards um, that in your career. As mentioned, the internships are an entry level um, opportunity for those with uh, little uh, experience, so that's a, a good opportunity to, to break in. Um, the pre-doctoral fellowships are ideally for those wanting to do some more research or apply for further funding, for example, to do a PhD, ideally. Um, the duration is largely the same. Most people do the opportunities over around a year, um, with the exception of the pre-doctoral fellowships that who um, some people take over uh, over two years. Penny's already uh, mentioned the fact that this uh, this intake starting in September will be over a maximum of 18 months. So the time commitment for both is, is considerably different, uh, uh, different for each opportunity. Uh, we offer 30 days for um, internships, around 225 hours to be taken flexibly according to what fits uh, with your sort of work pattern best. Um, an internship uh, and pre-doctoral fellowships this year are up to 50% of your uh, time. The main difference between these two schemes is that there is no backfill funding for internships. Um, this is something that for those people who want to apply to the pre-doc fellowships, but the internships as a backup, you will need to discuss with your, your manager, um, your employer. So if you were, for example, offered an internship in place of the pre-doctoral fellowship, um, you would need to make sure that the odd managers are, are aware of the fact that the internships don't come with any backfill funding, that you'll be released from your job for those 30 days. And we recognise that that's one of the big barriers to people uh, accessing the opportunities is uh, being able to carve out that time in your, your current role, your job um, in collaboration with your organisation to make sure that you get that dedicated time. So those discussions you should really be having now before you submit that application. So the training budget for each of the opportunities is slightly different. So all interns get a guaranteed £1,000 for, um, for a training. Um, you can access an additional uh, uh, pot of money if, if you want to do the master's level module with the agreement of your supervisor, but that is not uh, something that is, is taken from the original £1,000. So you still have that £1,000 to, to use, for example, for other training courses um, for a conference attendance. For pre-doctoral fellows, that is £2,000 and that includes the cost of a, a module. So in terms of supervision, um, pre-doctoral fellows will need to identify their uh, supervisors up front. I know we've got a couple of queries in the chat regarding supervisors, so I'll, I'll attend to those in a, in a second. But we expect people developing the pre-doctoral fellowship applications to identify supervisors who will support them. So um, you can't just write the name in, in the application form and of the best, we expect people to collaborate with the uh, supervisor beforehand to to make sure that they've read your application or they've read your ideas. They know a bit about your background, so have a meeting with them, the phone call, try and understand whether they're the best fit for you as a supervisor, uh, and and then get their buy-in so that they can uh, write a short couple of sentences about why they would be um, a good supervisor for you, and include that information in your your application. For interns, um, as Penny mentioned before, um, we use a matching process by which people um, who, who apply to the scheme and then um, we, we review the applications and, and we speak to you as a, as a potential intern and we understand who the best supervisor in ARC would be for you based on their experience. 
there's one application form for both opportunities. There's a tick box or a radio button which you have to select which opportunity you want to apply for. So just take care when when uh, applying through that. If you want only want to apply for the internship, make sure you tick the internship box and then all the questions for the pre dot for uh, fellowship don't come up because they're a lot more in depth. Interviews will be held on the 11th of July, so people might want to put those that date in their diary um, and we hope to um, let people know uh, within a, sort of a week after the in, in interviews uh, and start dates will be ideally on, on the first second week in September to coincide with the academic year. But if there are uh, if there are things like uh, differences in when you may be able to start the internship or pre-doctoral fellowship, use the application form to identify that in there and then we can we can review that with your, your application. Yeah, we can be we can be flexible. I think we just said September because that's when the online modules start and we need to get people registered for those if they if that's something they're doing. So it just works better for that, but we are flexible. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing so that I can actually see people. Um, there we go. And we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So um, how many places for the pre-doctoral fellowship are there? So it's, uh, we generally say we, we fund a minimum of four pre-doctoral fellowships. Again, we don't put a cap on the number that we can uh, uh, sort of um, support in terms of feasibility. So we, we 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 support as many as we can. We we generally, I think, the most we've taken on in one year was ten. Um, so we are we are limited by funding in that respect. Um, but we do have um, sort of different sources of funding in, in the past that we've been able to sort of bring in to fund people. Um, so if, if people have queries about, um, in particular, for example, I'm thinking about people in social care uh, or people, uh, people who are social workers, if you have um, a particular interest in applying for pre-doctoral fellowships, um, please do flag that to us uh, and make sure that's clear in your application that you're, you're a social worker from social care, because sometimes in, in specific areas we do have additional funding uh, to cover additional places. So um, please also make contact with me if you're from that background and you would like to apply, uh, please do let us know. So we have a question about supervision and this is a, again a sort of quite a frequent question in terms of trying to find a, an ARC supervisor so we ask people to find a supervisor that is working on an ARC project and all the researchers that are that, that applies to is the, uh, are listed on the ARC website so people can find their names there but as Penny mentioned before I've got the email address of people who want to more find out more information about um, those in ARC who, who are potential supervisors. If people are not having getting responses from people um, we know that there are all, always issues with people's emails not being um, sort of popping up in the inbox, going into spam mail. So sometimes people don't respond because of that or annual leave. Please do flag that to me and I can I'll try and help. So I'll, there's a couple of queries that I'll already sort of follow up with. So in terms of the training budget, we've got a question about how the £2,000 for training should be accessed. That funding is is held by ARC and we administer that funding. So um, we don't give you £2,000 to your organisation and, and that's, uh, expect them to administer it. It stays with us. We support booking of conferences and travel. Um, all we ask is that people identify potential opportunities early and you get the agreement in principle of your supervisor, your ARC supervisor. So once that is flagged to us, we know that you've got support of your supervisor or your primary supervisor, who potentially might not be somebody within ARC. Um, we can then take that forward, things like bookings and, and, and arrangements. So come to us early um, and we help with all the arrangements. That's the, the role of the sort of um, ARC team. So another question, if we are applying for the pre-doc for less than 50%, will it be enough to mention in the email? Um, so yeah, so we could, um, what I would do in that respect, because the application form owns for 50% um, funding, what I would potentially do in that uh, circumstances sort of use, there's a, a question which allows you to put any more information 
in there. If you want to apply to do the internship on a, a lower commitment, for example, 40%, um, flag that in the other information box or in, in a question that's appropriate relating to the amount of funding that you're requesting. Um, and we, we do we do ask for um, your finance department to email the team just to confirm the costs. So it could be as well in the email so that we've got that um, in both documents. So you could give the costs for 40% of your time and, and flag that, that that's that's the case. Um, as long as it's clear that that's, that's what's been requested, that's absolutely fine. And for the internship, will there be specific days on the 30 days that will need to attend, for example, lectures or training sessions? And if so, how many days in the 30 days are to be used flexibly? So I, th I think there's a, there's about six or seven sort of core training sessions that um, are typically online um, and recorded so that if you aren't able to make that one, then you can catch up. So we do make uh, we do run them at lunchtime as well so that they so that there's flexibility there for people to attend but i think there's six or seven so it's nice for people to be able to attend those because there's time to speak with others but we understand that that's not always going to be possible um the other commitment that is part of both the pre-doc and the internship is the showcase so um in the november typically in the november we ask that everybody attend um and it's uh we have decided actually whether it be face to face or online um, an event where you kind of share what um, you've learned over the time there. So present a poster. So that's we ask everybody who's been part of the, the kind of fellowships um, and the internships to 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 attend that. Um, but we get the date to you as soon as we can. Yeah, and I think the. That's a good point, Penny, in terms of um, giving people notice. So what we try and do is give people at least six weeks notice for any training sessions that are booked in so that people can arrange cover if needed. Um, so again, we, we record as many sessions as we can that happen online and put those access to those on the learning portal. We do have events in person where we um, get together um, as a group, so that might just be in terms of or with pre-doctoral uh, fellows as well. Um, we have events where some of our PhD students attend and other researchers um, and also um, we, we do like to um, have ad, ad hoc sessions where people uh, think there's a particular need so if there are things that people say they want extra support on people can come to us and we can consider putting on additional sessions we also have regular monthly peer-to-peer -peer support sort of meetings oh, yeah. online uh, which um which are a real good way just for people to be able to sort of discuss with each other how they're getting on provide an update um and raise concerns if they've if they've got anything that they want to discuss Yeah, I'd forgotten about those. They are really helpful. Those peer to peer support groups, you get to sort of have that kind of community with other people that are going through similar things and um, experience similar issues, but also can signpost to opportunities as well. So I think that's a real benefit. OK, any more questions? Any additional questions? As I mentioned before, the, the recording will be put on the, the website anyway for people to review again. But if I've, if people have specific queries that they want to send to me, more than happy, uh, I'm more than happy to receive sort of queries between now and the, the deadline. Um, it is the time when people should be sort of trying to finalise these in the, in, the, in the next couple of weeks. Typically, people will come uh, with lots of queries relating to finance in the, in the later stage of the application. We understand that people go on annual leave and things don't happen um, sometimes as, as quickly as we'd like them to. So if you have specific queries around things like that and, and getting sort of sign off from line managers, do come to me and we'll see how we can support because we have contacts with quite a lot of different people in the organisation so we can we can help with that. There's another quick query there. The online module it starts in September. Can you postpone to the October? 
So I think mm. in terms of if you were going to do the assessment, then you would start at the start of semester, which actually isn't the start of September. What we need to do is enrol people at the start of September so that you've got a place on that course. Typically, week one is sort of around the end, very end of September, start of October. That's sort of when it starts. Um, but it is good if you're doing the assessment and in order to keep up with the course to actually start in week one. But it is near, very near the start of October anyway. Um, if you're auditing the course, which means you're just looking through the materials and there's, you know, you can do that at any point. We don't need to sign you up to that um, to start at a particular time. You can dip in when and when you need to. That, that's a good point, Penny, and, and the audit only access, which is reviewing and giving access to the actual material. Uh, there's no cost to that if, if you are on the internship or the pre-doctoral fellowship. So we can give you access to University of Manchester modules um, that are, are relevant to your area of study um, for, for free. So that that's a, a nice way of being able to access the material without having to formally do the assessments. Uh, in terms of how many days is that course, I think that will vary according to which module because uh, I'm not sure typically what we would ask you to do when choosing the module that you want to do. If you have queries and um, if you have a look on the website at the Masters of Clinical Research or the, the, the um, particular module that you're interested in taking, if you want to detail that in your training plan um, for, for your application, there, there should be a named contact in terms of who leads the module. So they will be best placed to sort of accept queries about about how much time each of the modules takes. Yeah, they're typically run the as a, as a sort of e-learning course, so that you can dip in. The amount of material could be a certain sort of uh, maybe a certain number of hours, which you can get, like Ross said. Um, but it's one of those where you can dip into the various e-lectures that are online, the workbooks that perhaps are given, or the activities, or the wikis, or whatever the medium is. But that can be sort of self-paced over that week. That's typically how things are run. A couple more queries. So uh, query around any good websites or resources which can help guide a realistic Gantt chart or timeline um, for the different elements we'd like to do for the pre-doc. What I would say initially on that is we we don't have to do something that is incredibly detailed. I think they are um, it's something that would need to be um, a guide to, to understand um, how you would segment, you know, sections of your, your pre-doc. And you might even want to do that in, say, three three sections or relating to the, the pieces of work that you want to do. Um, often Gantt charts are done in an Excel spreadsheet and, and, and sort of uh, cropped and then um, in, imported into other documents. So if you wanted to use something very simple like Excel to help you do that, then that's fine. But in terms of the actual, um, the detail that you need, um, I, I, I wouldn't be too um, keen on people putting lots and lots of detail in that. Your Gantt chart, your timeline could even be um, a series of bullet points within the application itself. So you don't have to do a Gantt chart. It's not an actual requirement. But if you did want to do one, um, once you've submitted your application, if you email that Gantt chart to the generic ARC email address, um, the ARC GM email address, which should be in the guidance, that's absolutely fine. But if you've got another query that you want to follow up with if I've not answered that question then please drop me a line and I'll, I'll try and help with that. I suppose in terms of knowing how long something might take you you know how long does it take to do a systematic review um, or a certain type of review or what have you you can run those things past your intended supervisors um, yeah. as well just to get their feelings on on whether this is something that looks like uh, it's feasible. Um, yeah, so I would do that. Another couple of um, queries. For those not aspiring to do a traditional PhD, will the scheme still be relevant? E.g. professional doctorate, PhD by publication. So ideally, the pre-doc fellowship is set up for people who would like to apply for a competitive, uh, competitively funded PhD. Uh, typically, these might include NIHR uh, PhD fellowships or other charitable organisations who uh, fund PhDs. Having said that, 
some people come to, to the pre-doctoral fellowship and find out that a different route is for them um, during their pre-doc fellowship. And, and we're, we, we don't want to con confine people to only applying to the PhD, but you'll notice in the application itself, there is a box um, that asks people to commit to developing a competitive PhD proposal. If there are different approaches um, that mean you will get into a, a, a research by a different route, for example, PhD by publication, and you want to use that time to work on some publications or to gather some data that will help you build that, then that may be considered. Um, again, if you've got a specific query um, relating to that, please do drop me a line afterwards and I can, and I can try and advise a little bit more. Penny, do you have any more input on that one? Um, no, I, th I think, uh, like I said, it was, it's a bit of a journey and by the end of the pre-doc, it may be that that's something we're, we're not going to tie you into it, but ideally this is about clinical academic sort of competitive funding for, for that kind of route. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think exploring the options is perfectly um, feasible for you to do over the period of the pre-doc if, if you are looking at others, other options um, and it's worth sort of considering. I would probably have some of those conversations now with people that you know that have gone down those routes as well if if because a professional doctorate is quite different to a, a research doctorate. Um, so have those may, maybe something to do sooner rather than later. And I think one last query, can the £2,000 be used to travel to other relevant services? So if I would say if there is a an element that relates to research, for example, there's a particular research unit that's it's at another service or there's some research, for example, a trial or some other type of research that's happening there that you want to go and observe and you have connections there. I think that would be absolutely um, sort of fine to use that budget in that way. Um, it may be that there's something being implemented that you're interested in evaluating. Again, these things, um, that, that's actually quite a, a novel query. I've not had that query before, but if there's a research or a research training element to that, that activity, then that would be quite legitimate to include that in your application to identify that as something that you'd want to, that you'd want to do. Yeah, I think it has to be related to research in some way, but that that that's quite broad, isn't it? Because it, it if it's something clinical, but it's something you want to research, then it could be the two kind of come together, and that's fine. So I just think an a an a justification for why that is important for your intended research would be would be all that would be required to for us to kind of consider that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to stop the recording now.